Hey everyone, I'm Tom from Sleep Foundation. You know, the last year or two has been pretty tough for all of us. We've had a deadly pandemic, we've had soaring unemployment, and obviously a profound disruption to our daily life. What the last year or so has also done has shown a bright light on issues of inequality, social inequality, income inequality, and certainly racial inequality. So at Sleep Foundation, we're actually kind of interested in how those issues of inequality filter down to our sleep and our sleep habits. And specifically, we wanted to know a little bit more about how this disruption has negatively impacted or disproportionately impacted people of color. So to help us understand the effects of racism on people of color, and specifically their sleep habits, we talked to Dr. Dana Johnson, assistant professor at the Department of Epidemiology at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Well, thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. I'd, I'd love to just kind of start by having you tell me what your background is and how you actually found your way into sleep scholarship. Yeah, so it's actually a really uh, interesting story. So um, my interest in science period before I discovered sleep was in health disparities. I was very interested in understanding some of the reasons why certain groups um, we're more likely to have certain conditions and have more severe disease for uh, specific conditions. And so when I started my PhD program, I knew I would focus on um, neighborhood disadvantage, which uh, at the time and still currently was one of the main hypothesized contributors to cardiovascular disease. I was attending a conference and I heard a talk by Gary Gibbons who is now the head of NHLBI at the time, he was at Morehouse in the Cardiovascular Institute. And um, he had this talk and he had one slide that mentioned sleep as a risk factor for stroke. And I don't know why, but it resonated with me and made me think uh, a little bit more about sleep. And I thought, I've never, I've never considered sleep as a scientific topic or even as a health behavior. I thought about it in terms of something I do every night and mm -hmm. never, you know, never thought more about it, right? Just something that people do. So it just, it made me think more. And, you know, I did some research and of course, um, I found articles that show that sleep was related to different cardiovascular outcomes. And I thought, well, perhaps this is the pathway that's connecting neighborhoods and cardiovascular disease. And so um, I wrote to my advisors and said, I wanna study sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I did my PhD focused on sleep. I studied psychosocial stressors and neighborhoods. And then I did a postdoc at Harvard to really refine my sleep skills. And so that's where I really learned about how to measure sleep and analyze sleep variables from um, different sleep studies. So one of the things I'm mindful of as I launch a series on sleep inequality, like we can have this conversation about how one's race impacts that inequality, but like you can't bracket that outside the scope of economics, outside the scope of policy. And I find that like we can have this conversation about people of color, but you know, we're also gonna have this conversation about socioeconomic status, education status. Like if I, if I pull the string, it's all kind of intertwined. For some of it, yes. So there's this um, framework word called intersectionality that is right. in the epidemiology word, world, we're really pushing for people to understand these different intersections of race, gender, socioeconomic status. So um, I think a good place to start here is what we're usually uh, taught and, and what we expect is as your socioeconomic status increases, your health is better, hmm. right? That's usually what we expect. You know, more income, more education, you have better access to healthcare, you should have better health. And that's typically in general what we see. Now, when it comes to racial minorities, we do not see that for African-Americans in particular. We actually see, if you look within African-Americans, that those that are higher on the socioeconomic gradient, they actually have worse sleep than those on the lower 
socioeconomic gradient. So we are not seeing education and income as protective for their sleep health. And so I'm sure you're wondering, why would that be, right? Like you have this access and everything else that matters. So the reason why, and it really goes back to what are we actually studying? So you mentioned race. So it's not actually race that we're really interested in. So when we're talking about race, we're really considering that as a social construct. So which means it is a proxy for social experiences. So when we're using race in these studies, what we're really trying to get at is racism. So we're really talking about the experiences that you have because of your skin color. So at this level, you can be either um, more likely to be the minority at your job, which opens you up to more experiences of discrimination or microaggressions. You're more likely to be a minority in your neighborhoods. Uh, there could be other, um, other situations or other factors um, such as um, feeling like you have to work harder. So uh, imposter syndrome tends to be common. So that's you know, another work-related stress that you're working harder. Uh, you're trying to ensure that people understand that you're there because of your skill and talent and not your race. So there's all these other factors that come into play that are potentially contributing to why we see worse health among this population. So if we go back in time and we think about um, segregation, right? So people were separated based on their race. And so you were segregated into different neighborhoods. And so we know each of those neighborhoods were different in terms of education. So all the things that are fundamental to where you are in life. Education, so the quality of schools were different. Um, the um, access to healthy food is, was different and still different till today. And we still know inner city schools, large um, public uh, school systems are not as good as smaller school systems, right? That tend to be in urban areas where racial minorities are more likely to live. Um, healthcare access is more limited. Transportation is different. So if we think about all of those things, all of those things uh, and how they were separated. And then if you add in things like redlining and housing covenants, which um, either denied minorities from having uh, home ownership in affluent areas, and you know they were restricted to um, more disadvantaged areas. And even till today, African Americans are more likely to live in areas below their uh, income level. And so you have this generational uh, gap that is consistently happening to where you are not at the right um, you know, place. You're already starting off at a dis disadvantage at birth. So if you are in an area that lacks sidewalks, if you do not have access to healthy food, if you are a shift worker or if you um, work rotating shifts, your circadian rhythms are misaligned. And so your eating, pa eating patterns are off. And so that contributes to weight gain. Short and sleep duration contributes to weight gain. Our hormone yeah. secretion is altered and so on. And so we know obesity is one of the major risk factors for sleep apnea. But the other piece of this that really relates to sleep inequities is that minorities are less likely to be screened for a sleep disorder, although they're more likely to have that sleep disorder. So if you go to see your physician and you have your 10 to 15 minutes, uh, what we're seeing is that they're not being asked about their sleep. And so they don't get referred to the sleep clinic for proper screening. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that because uh, one of the questions I had here is like, to the degree that there are recommendations for solving a problem like this, is it a policy prescription? Is it a messaging solution? Is it an economic solution? What, what would you say? There's different levels that we need to target. So at the individual level, I think we need to do a better job with um, promoting healthy sleep practices. So mm -hmm. making sure people understand how much sleep they should get 
make sure they understand uh, the symptoms of sleep apnea, the symptoms of insomnia, just like we understand the symptoms for a stroke, right? We have commercials to tell us. And then if we move through these different levels, we can think about the household environment. You know, we need to make sure that people are sheltered at the bare minimum, right? And then additionally, that they are in homes that are intentionally designed to promote sleep. And then if we think about the neighborhood level, we need to reduce air pollution. And all of these things are really targeted um, at, at any inequities, particularly because it's racial minorities that live in these areas. So one example would be to increase minimum wage, make it an actual livable wage. So if you're making a minimum wage and you have a family, you probably need multiple jobs, right? And so that interrupts your sleep. If you are working several jobs, uh, you are um, going to have some interruptions. You may not be home to implement a consistent bedtime with your children. So then they are set at a trajectory of not having a bedtime routine and that a consistent that will contribute to worse sleep in adulthood. Well, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I'm, I'm really grateful for your time. And I think you've uh, helped me or given me a new lens into how to frame this problem. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And all of these root causes can address several things, not just sleep. You know, we can improve sleep. We can, you know, reduce obesity. We can improve quality of life, decrease mortality. There's so much and uh, we just need to do it.